Hi, my name is Tim Spears. I'm a fire inspector with the Colorado Springs Fire Department and I'm here today to talk to you about classroom and schools fire safety. A couple things that as we examine the hallway and the corridor system here in the school, we want to take a look at a few things. For example, the trash can that's over here in the hallway. The corridor system itself should not be used to store any materials, any combustible materials. So within that trash can we're going to find all sorts of waste and combustible materials, but also too back here with the desks. We want to make sure that we maintain that area clear and unobstructed of any potential trip hazards uh, from people exiting those classrooms. Within the corridor system, we have fire extinguishers located throughout. Typically, we'll find them about 75 feet apart, so that way if we're in a classroom, we can make sure to access a fire extinguisher that's closest to us. So we want to make sure in front of this fire extinguisher cabinet, we don't have anything piled up in front of it. What will happen a lot of times is we'll have trash cans, we'll have boxes, things like that. So we want to make sure that we keep this area along with the hallway clear and unobstructed. We also too want to make sure that we can access that fire extinguisher cabinet. A lot of times these doors will get bent or we'll be missing the handles. So we want to ensure that we can actually access that fire extinguisher in case there is an emergency. So we see here in this vestibule, this exit vestibule, that we see these areas being used for storage many times. Uh, for example, we've got this cart here. Uh, this cart does two things. One, it blocks the pole station back behind this cart, but then also too, it blocks this exit door. So it's important that we maintain, just like the corridor system, uh, um, just like the classroom exit doors, that we maintain this exit door clear and unobstructed uh, because we want to be able to access that pole station and this exit door in case there's an emergency. So standing here at the exit door for the library area, we want to ensure that we keep our exit doors clear and obstructed. Uh, we see very often and very frequently that we have various things that are placed in front of those doors. So for example, we have the exit sign here, but we've got a, a cart with rolled paper, and then we have an audio-visual cart placed in front of the exit door. So it's important that we keep these doorways clear and obstructed for full and instant use in case there is an emergency. So in addition to the corridor walls, the classroom walls, we also want to make sure that we don't decorate the, our corridor doors. It's very important that we don't wrap them in wrapping paper like we see a lot of times for the Christmas season. We also want to make sure too that we don't obstruct that door um, doorway so that way people can get in and out in case there is an emergency because a lot of times these decorations will get pinched within the doorway and then prevent that door from closing and latching properly. So it's important that we keep these clear and we don't decorate these doors so again, we don't actually spread that fire any further. And speaking of the Christmas holiday season, we want to ensure that if we do use Christmas lights or holiday lights, that we only use them for temporary lighting. Uh, the code only allows those lights to be up for 90 days. So once that season is done, we need to ensure that we take those down. <clears throat> we see very often and very frequently that we leave those lights up throughout the, throughout the year. So it's important that we don't leave them up for any longer than 90 days. In addition to making sure that we maintain our corridor doors clear and unobstructed, our exit doors and things like that, we also want to make sure that we don't block our corridor doors open. It's important that we don't block these doors open because these doors do a great job keeping compartmentalizing fire and then keeping the fire within the classroom or within the area that it started in. So it's important that we don't block these doors open. As we can see here, we've got a trash can. We see that many times, blocking doors open. We also, too, have a door wedge down here. It's important that we don't utilize those door wedges. Those can be also be another safety hazard. But also, too, up here in the door jam, many times we'll find these door wedges in those door jams. And then what it does, if that door, somebody try, attempts to close that door, what will happen is they'll ruin the door jam, and so then that door doesn't close and latch properly. So we want to ensure that we don't block these doors open with these type of devices. So as that door shuts, we want to make sure that it latches in place because that latching mechanism will help to compartmentalize that fire. And we don't want that pro those products of combustion, the smoke, the heat, the gas, to affect our exiting system. We want to make sure that this is our protective means of egress. And we don't want that, those products of combustion to affect the people exiting the building. So earlier we talked about the things on the corridor wall. As we can see, this, this wall definitely exceeds the 20% requirement. So it's important that we keep these walls limited to that 20% because we don't want that fire to spread from one area of the building to another based on the things that we decorate on the wall. 
So we can see another problem with excessive decoration when we exceed that 20%, and that is obstructing our fire alarm pole station. As we can see here, we've got this paper that's been placed around this pole station. So it does a great job obscuring that pole station. <clears throat> so we need to ensure that we keep these areas clear and unobstructed so that way if there is a fire, people exiting the building or even exiting this classroom behind me can pull this pole station to alert the occupants of the fire. In addition to the artwork that we find in the corridors, teaching materials that we find on classroom walls, we also find decorations due to the holiday season. For example, we've got the spider web that's over here behind, off to my left. Um, very nice, but also very flammable and very combustible. Many times we'll see teachers and students want to hang things from the sprinkler heads, um, especially that type of spider web material. And then off to the right, we have a, uh, a vine that goes up the pillar, which is made out of uh, construction paper. And so another very good combustible material that will help promote that spread of that fire across that surface of that pillar. But also, too, we want to examine and we want to take a look at those, those classroom walls. For example, here we have a piece of uh, rolled paper that has been placed on the wall and been used to decorate for the Halloween season. So we want to ensure that in addition to that 20% that we, we want to limit to the corridor walls, we also want to do the same thing with the classroom walls. It's very important that we limit those decorations so that way we don't promote that spread of the fire from other areas of the building to other portions of that classroom or that corridor system. Earlier, as we were in the corridor, we, we discussed the fire extinguishers and ensuring that we keep, these, keep the area in front of those fire extinguishers clear and unobstructed. This is a very good example of items that are piled up in front of that fire extinguisher that prevent the occupant from acquiring it in case there is an emergency. We also see how this bracket that's used to help hold that fire extinguisher in place and prevent it from being damaged from falling off the bracket, it's been broken and it's not securing that fire extinguisher. So it's very important that we we keep this area clear and unobstructed, but we also, too, maintain that fire extinguisher, maintain that bracket and that cabinet to prevent that fire extinguisher from being damaged. Here in the uh, computer area, we find a surge protector. The surge protector is located right next to this printer. We need to ensure that we don't plug a surge protector into another surge protector. We see very frequently how we don't have enough outlets. And so to be able to accommodate the, the new, more computers or the more technology needs that we need to put in place, we have these surge protectors. And so we have surge protectors that are plugged into other surge protectors. So it's very important that we don't do that. And also, too, that we don't plug that surge protector into an extension cord. Uh, the code also requires that the surge protectors be UL listed. They have to be listed in accordance with a testing laboratory. So here on this surge protector, we'll find that UL listing on the bottom of that surge protector. So we need to ensure that it has that. Also, too, it's got the surge suppression or a circuit breaker built into the surge protector. We can see how this has a lighted on-off switch. When this light goes out on that on-off switch, it's probably about time that we need to change that surge protector because that circuit breaker within that surge protector has gone bad. So it's important that we make sure to keep an eye on that and change it whenever necessary. So remember, never plug a surge protector into another surge protector, but also to never use an extension cord with a surge protector. Ensure that they're UL listed and they have this lighted on off switch so that way you know when you need to replace it. So moving into the classroom, we're now looking at some of those common fire, fire safety and fire code violations that we commonly find in a lot of these classrooms. Uh, here we see how this power cord to the surge protector is covered by a rug. It's important that we don't cover our power cords and we don't run those power cords through a door frame. These power cords are a good heat source in case that we have, if we have a fire. So it's important that we don't cover them. We don't run them through the ceiling tile. We don't run them through the door frame because we don't want those cords to be in impinged or pinched upon because they are a good heat source to help start a fire. So it's important that we don't put any rugs on top of them, we don't run them through a door frame, and that we don't run them through the ceiling tile. Moving into some of the storage areas off of classrooms, we see that some, sometimes the storage can affect our areas, our fire protection areas, from our fire extinguishers to our sprinkler heads. So as we see here, we've got a lot of materials piled, piled up in front of our fire extinguisher cabinet. We discussed that earlier, but 
within classrooms, a lot of times these areas get overlooked and we'll put things in front of them and obstruct the fire extinguisher cabinet. Also too, being in a chemical science classroom storage area, we see chemicals that are stored here on the ground without lids. And so it's important that we make sure that we maintain the lids on the chemicals that we do have. But also too, that we maintain our chemicals, uh, our chemical storage neat and orderly. As we can see here, we've got chemicals that are all along this um, this countertop and so these chemicals should be stored in their proper containers they shouldn't be stored next to other incompatible materials and we ensure that we keep all our storage neat and orderly as we talk about the fi fire protection systems and since this building is equipped with a sprinkler system we want to ensure that we don't s put any storage within 18 inches of that sprinkler head deflector so it's important that we keep those keep those areas clear and unobstructed but we also to keep our fire extinguisher clear and obstructed. We maintain our storage neat and orderly and we also properly store our chemicals, making sure that we have our MSDS sheets and that we store them in the proper cabinets. We also have a fire, uh, a flame retardant cabinet or a, a flammable liquids cabinet right here. So it's important that we don't put anything up in front of this cabinet and that we maintain the doors. We see that the, a lot of times these doors are left unlocked, but also too, we see how these doors can be damaged and that they don't latch properly. In addition to keeping our fire protection system and our fire protection equipment clear and unobstructed, we also want to ensure that we keep our emergency eye wash stations and our emergency showers clear and unobstructed. Many times we'll see things piled up in front of it or we'll see them decorated, uh, things hanging from them. And we want to ensure that we keep these clear and unobstructed so that way in case there is an emergency, they're ready for full and instant use. Continuing in the classroom, we see violations such as improper use of extension cords. Extension cords should not be used as a source of permanent wiring or a replacement for permanent wiring. Also too, we want to ensure that we use extension cords on mobile appliances such as, this, such as this cart here with the overhead projector. And that when we're done using that device, that we wind the cord back up on the cart and that we put it away. Uh, we see a lot of times that these devices are left in place and attached to this extension cord. Speaking of extension cords, we have one here that's being used for another device that we find up on the desk. And so it's important that we don't use these extension cords as a substitute for permanent wiring. Uh, it's important that we use them only on port portable appliances and that we put them away when we're done using them. We also see that how this extension cord here is plugged into this power strip. This is not necessarily an example of a surge protector. So this would be another thing that we would want to take a look at. Uh, all this is doing is just adding more outlets to this outlet here. So it's important that if we're going to use a device like this, we use one that has that built-in surge suppression in it. And that too, we're not plugging this extension cord into that surge protector or that power strip. We need to eliminate those extension cords. Those are extension cords are only used for portable appliances and only used for temporary means. So earlier we talked about making sure that we keep our areas clear and unobstructed such as our fire extinguishers, our fire blankets, and our emergency showers. This just provides another example of how often these these type of violations do happen. It's important that we keep these areas clear and unobstructed because if we have a fire, we want to be able to grab, grab that fire extinguisher, be able to utilize it, and be able to get it in case there's an emergency. So it's important that we keep this area clear and unobstructed at all times. It's important that we minimize our decorations, our teaching materials, and our artworks on our classroom walls to no more than 20% because we don't want to promote the spread of the flame, the fire across that surface to other combustible material found within that room. Another thing that we see within classrooms is window treatments, whether or not they're non-combustible like the aluminum blinds that we have over here or the curtains that we have over here. It's important that our window treatments either are non-combustible or they're flame retardant. We see we have curtains here. There's different methods and ways that we can make these flame retardant or we can purchase them being flame retardant. So it's important that if we do utilize a product to make those flame retardant, that it meets the National Fire Protection Association Standard 701. That standard kind of dictates or talks about and discusses the performance criteria that the flame retardancy has to meet in order for those in order for it to be considered flame retardant. 
So if you have any questions on what products to use or how to make curtains or draperies or anything like that flame retardant, contact your facility staff member. Those facility staff or building managers should have products or know where to acquire products so that way you can work and try to make these curtains flame retardant if they aren't already. So as the seasons change, uh, we see a lot of these auxiliary type of heating devices, these space heaters, these portable electric space heaters. It's important that we use these properly if we're actually going to use them. It's important that we don't place them within three feet of any combustible material. Uh, the combustible material includes anything that's going to burn, so like a desktop here, the chair behind me, or even the carpet. It's important that we keep that clearance. Also too, these portable electric space heaters have to be what's called labeled and listed. They have to be listed by a, a, a uh, testing laboratory. Typically you'll see a underwriter's laboratory's uh, stamp and seal of approval on these type of portable electric space heaters. It's also important too that when we plug these space heaters in that we don't plug them into surge protectors and we don't use extension cords with them. We need to plug these directly into the wall. So the key things to remember with our portable electric space heaters are making sure that we maintain our clearance between the electric space heater and combustibles, a minimum of three feet, and that they're listed and labeled, and that when we plug them in, that we don't plug them into surge protectors or extension cords. So in regards to some specialty classrooms, currently we're standing in the wood shop. Some things to consider are making sure that we don't allow our com the combustible dust from the products that we're working on to allow to them to accumulate on equipment, but also on the floor. As we can see here, we've got combustible dust that's been allowed to settle on the equipment, but also too down here on the floor. And we wanna ensure that we don't allow that to accumulate, but also too, we wanna make sure that we don't spray it off with any type of compressed air because what can happen is it can create a hazard. It can throw that combustible dust up in the air and then if it, if it hits an ignition source we can have a dust explosion. So it's important that we use our dust collection system and that we make sure that we maintain our equipment free of any combustible dust. So we've been discussing how we need to avoid allowing that combustible dust and those combustible fibers to accumulate on equipment and on floors. As we can see here, we've allowed that combustible dust to accumulate in some of these corners in those concealed spaces. These are those areas that are, are missed while we're cleaning and things like that. So it's important that we keep these areas also clear of this combustible dust and that we don't use our compressed airs and that we use our vacuum or our dust collection system to be able to collect these materials and keep it free so that way to prevent any potential fire hazard. Another special consideration to keep in mind when we're in the shop classroom is these containers here, these containers are used for oil soak soaked rags when we're working on wood projects. It's important that we keep this mechanism here, the self-closing device, operational because what can happen is these can be damaged or the arm here can be removed from the bucket. So it's important that we, we keep these things operational and that we also empty these nightly. Uh, these rags, these oil soaked rags have been known to start fires through spontaneous combustion and so it's important that as we combust complete our day, that we empty these buckets and empty the, the, these buckets with the rags and dispose of them properly. So throughout this video, we have discussed many different fire code and fire safety violations. It's important that we follow these rules and regulations. One, it keeps you safe, but it also keeps the students and the rest of the building occupants safe. Another thing to keep in mind is we want to make sure that we maintain the building systems that we have in place. From our fire protection systems, either our fire alarm systems, our sprinkler systems, making sure that we don't block our fire extinguisher cabinets with any materials. Also too, that we don't block our corridor doors open. We want to try to compartmentalize a fire if it should happen to occur within that room or that classroom. But always remember, if there is a fire in the building, it's important to follow your emergency evacuation plans and exit the building appropriately and practice those drills like they're re the real thing. But when you exit the building, make sure to pull the pole station. There's two things that happen with that. You notify the occupants, but then also too you notify the fire department of the emergency here in the building. So it's important that you follow all these procedures, all these guidelines, not only from the fire code side, but also emergency evacuation procedures to help keep you safe and keep everybody else in the building safe. If you should have any further questions in regards to anything that was shown in the video or anything that wasn't shown in the video, please don't hesitate to contact the Colorado Springs Fire Department, Division of the Fire Marshal.